When you hear the words bank bailout, what exactly comes to mind? Is it the Great Recession, the financial crisis? Is it the movie The Big Short? Maybe it reminds you of the time that a bunch of greedy, dumb banks used customer deposits, loaded up on worthless assets, and then when they all realized they were worthless, the Federal Reserve comes in, buys those assets from the banks at full price, letting the banks off the hook without realizing any of the losses. Well, you may not be surprised to hear that what I just described, while it does fit what happened during the financial crisis, is also the description of what has been happening behind the scenes in the banking system since March of 2023. And not only has it been happening continuously since then, it has only been growing. In 2008, the worthless asset was mortgage-backed securities. Today, it's United States treasuries. But while this bailout of the banking system continues to grow to record highs on a weekly basis, it is scheduled to end in just a few months in March of 2024. So the question is, what happens to banks, to treasuries, to the bond market, and everybody else once this bailout finally ends? Well, to find out, we have to take a little bit of a trip back in time to when the crazy money printing started in 2020. It's actually incredible how fast the time has gone, but that was almost four years ago now. And you probably remember the frenzy that is accompanied by a loose money environment. When the money printers turn on, when the interest rates drop, everybody's trying to spend money like crazy and make money like crazy. Massive frauds, massive bubbles, the scammers come out of the woodworks, and everybody is trying to get extraordinary returns. And as it turns out, banks are obviously no different. During 2020 and 2021, banks were sitting on this cash trying to figure out what is it that we should do with this cash. And if you remember, at that time, the Federal Reserve, specifically Powell, was saying things like, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. We're here to try and stabilize the economy, make sure a crash doesn't happen. We're gonna keep the money printers on and keep interest rates low. So what did the banks do? They believed the Fed was telling the truth. And so they loaded up on US Treasuries. Because if you think that interest rates are going to stay low and you're sitting on a bunch of newly printed cash, why would you not put it in the safest place possible by US treasuries and get that risk-free return? And that's exactly what banks did. They gorged on treasuries. So here's why that's a problem. The price of a bond and the interest rate, the yield on bonds is inversely correlated. Consider the fact that if I borrow $100 from you at 5%, interest rate, then I'm gonna to have to pay you back $105. Let's say a couple of months from now, interest rates everywhere else go up. So now instead of the going interest rate being 5%, the new going interest rate is 10%. Let's also say at the exact same time, you need to get out of this arrangement. You can't wait until a whole year passes for me to pay you back the $105. So you need to sell this debt to somebody else. Well, you're not going to be able to sell this debt, this contract between us for $100. Because if you sell it for $100 to somebody else, I'm gonna pay them back $105, which means they're only gonna get a 5% return. But if they take that same $100 and loan it out to somebody else, they'll get the going rate of 10%, which would give them $110. So the only way that you're gonna convince anybody to buy this debt from you is if you increase the yield, or in other words, decrease the price. Because no matter what happens at the end, I'm paying back $105 to whoever I owe it to, whether it's you or somebody else. Which means if you want to sell this debt to somebody, you're probably going to have to sell it for $95. Because then when somebody pays $95 to buy that debt from you, they're gonna get $105 back from me, which is roughly 10%. We're just rounding here to make the math easier. So you loaned me $100 expecting to get a 5% return, but because you had to exit the debt before maturity, before I paid you back, you had to sell it at a loss of $5 for a total of 95. So now you see where the problem arises with banks loading up on US treasuries during 2020 and 2021. During that time period, interest rates were at rock bottom levels. The 10 year treasury was trading under 1% until January of 2021. And even into 2021, it barely got above one and a half percent. And as long as these banks can hold that debt until maturity, there's no problem. They're gonna collect back 
the principal plus the interest. But that's the problem because inflation stuck around far longer and far higher than anyone at the Fed or anybody in charge of monetary or fiscal policy could have ever imagined because apparently they don't know how these things work. And so the Fed panicked and they embarked on one of the fastest and most aggressive cycles of rate hikes in history. And we saw the yield on the 10 year treasury go from a bottom of a half a percent in August of 2020. And it climbed and climbed and climbed as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates until it peaked at 5% in October of 2023. Going from a half a percent to 5% is a 10X increase in the interest rate, which means at the same time, you have catastrophic destruction of the values, the prices of those bonds. Those previously existing bonds that were issued at a half a percent, 1% 1 or one and a half percent. They're worth far less than they were worth when those loans were made because the going interest rates now are much higher. So if you need to get out of those old bonds, you must sell them at a much lower price. Otherwise nobody will buy them. Now again, this is no issue if you just hold on to the bonds until maturity. The borrower will simply pay back the principal plus interest. And this is what the banks were hoping for. But obviously in March of 2023, this all blew up in banks' faces. And the new banking crisis erupted in March of 2023, starting with Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. What banks were not anticipating was a bank run where individuals decide we're gonna pull all of our cash out. And the reason why banks were not banking on this is because bank runs rarely happen. The reason why bank runs rarely happen though is because bank runs themselves are in many cases not possible. If all the people go to withdraw their funds from the bank, the bank will be able to meet those withdrawal requests, which means those people don't have to worry about taking their money out now because they know they can get it out. Ironically, the only times that bank runs happen is when people can't get their money out because somebody on the inside gets wind of the fact that the banks don't have enough to meet those withdrawal requests, which means that that first person takes their money out, then they call up the people they're closest to and say, you should go get your money out and the bank run erupts. The problem with this is that it wasn't just Silicon Valley Bank. Every single bank was in the exact same situation. There was no bank in America that was not underwater on its portfolio of assets, which means if a bank run happened anywhere else, the exact same thing would happen. The bank would fall. As a result, the Federal Reserve stepped in and created a new bailout facility called the Bank Term Funding Program. This is the chart that I showed you earlier of the Bank Term Funding Program. You can see it was never in use as far back as this chart goes because when it was created in March of 2023, that was the first time it was able to be used and the usage of this facility skyrocketed within one month to $80 billion. So what exactly is the bank term funding program? Why is it a bailout of the banks? And even farther, why is it a bailout of the treasury market and the entire bond market? Real quick, I am running a 50% off sale for Heresy Financial University, but there are only 10 slots available for this sale. First come first serve, it is only open to the first 10 people who sign up. If you're interested, I'll explain more at the end of this video, so stick around if you want the details. So what exactly is the BTFP, the Bank Term Funding Program? Well, according to the Federal Reserve, this facility was created to support American businesses and households by making additional funding available to eligible depository institutions. Oh, how nice, they're doing this to support American households in businesses. This facility offers loans of up to one year in length to banks or other eligible depository institutions. Institutions can pledge collateral like US treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, or other forms of debt. And most importantly, these assets will be valued at par. If you don't know what that is, that is the biggest deal of the BTFP, so I'm going to explain. Imagine we rewind the clock and the year is 2009. You bought your house for $500,000, but if you were to sell it on the market today, you could only get 250,000 for it. So you're sitting on a 50% loss, which is the same position that banks were in with most of their US Treasury portfolios. The bank term funding program at the Fed would be like the Fed going to you in 2009 and saying, hey, I know you bought your house for 500 grand. And I know if you sold it to anybody else on the open market right now, you'd get 250 grand. But if you sell it to us, we will pay you the full 500 grand because that's what you paid for it. So that's what it's worth. So we'll buy it from you at full price so that you don't have to sell it on the open market and take a loss and affect 
the prices of the other houses in your neighborhood. Sounds pretty nice, right? The only caveat to this is that you have to repurchase the house back from them in one year. And according to this fact sheet from federalreserve.org, the BTFP is a temporary facility and will shut down on March 11th of 2024, just a couple months from now. And to me, the wildest part of this whole thing is how banks actually access the BTFP. In order to obtain an advance under the BTFP, eligible borrowers must submit a request using a standard template email to its lending reserve bank at the time it requests its first advance. Like literally send an email. Can you imagine sitting there, the head of your bank, typing up an email to your Federal Reserve Bank saying, hey, can I please access some of that free money and sell you some of my underwater securities at full price so that I don't have to shut down from a bank run? Thanks, Jamie Dimon. And this is essentially the reason why the BTFP is a bailout for all banks, because if you are a bank and you are sitting on unrealized losses, assets that are worth less than what you paid for them, you can sell them to the Fed right now for full price get access to that cash and do something else with it, anything else with it. The only promise you have to make is that you'll buy that asset back from them in a year. This means banks don't have to worry about all those withdrawal requests, the deposit flights, they can meet that as much as it happens. And as we can see from the chart of the bank term funding program, it is skyrocketing in usage lately. As of January 3rd, the record usage of this facility hit 141 billion dollars. So the situation that started in March of 2023, or at least when we noticed the situation when Silicon Valley Bank failed, it is only getting worse under the hood. So the next question is, why does this amount to an indirect bailout of the entire treasury market? Well, think about this from the perspective of the house example. If you're sitting on an unrealized loss of $250,000 and you have to sell your house, now suddenly that affects the comps. That means all the other houses in the area that are equal are probably worth $250,000 as well. With bonds like treasuries, it's even more so because there's one going rate with very, very little discrepancy, bonds are basically fungible. Not quite, but close enough. And so if banks faced with these withdrawal requests had to start selling all these US treasuries at massive losses, that would have been a fire sale. That would have pushed interest rates up extremely quickly as the price of those bonds they were selling started to collapse. Because every time one bank sold, that would make the losses for everybody else even worse, and that would force some of them to start to have to sell as well, be a downhill spiral. And so the fact that banks can sell these treasuries to the Fed at full price without unloading them on the market at all means that the treasury market doesn't experience a single dollar of selling. It all goes direct to the Fed instead of to the open market, meaning that prices are not affected downward. Now, this also amounts to an indirect bailout of the entire bond market overall, because the United States Treasury is considered the safe haven asset, the bedrock, the foundation of the financial system. It is considered the risk-free asset, which means when you're looking at loaning money, to a corporation, whether large or small, or to the US government, you're going to expect a higher interest rate, a higher yield, if you lend money to a corporation or an individual or a small company or anybody else, because they carry an inherently higher degree of risk. At the end of the day, the US government can always print the money or use its military to collect taxes to pay its debts. And so if you could get 5% from the US government, 6%, 7% from the US government, you're going to demand more than that from anybody else. Imagine for a moment with me, if the US government was paying 20% on its debt, hypothetically, there'd be zero money invested in the stock market. Everything would sell from the stock market to be lent to the United States government, let alone being lent out to somebody else as debt. And since we know that when you sell assets, it pushes the prices down, and when the price of bonds goes down, interest rates go up. And if banks were forced to sell all these treasuries on the open market, it would push the prices of treasuries down and the yields on treasuries up, it would have the exact same effect on the rest of the bond market, just to a greater extent. So why is the BTFP skyrocketing in usage right now as we close in with just a couple of months left before the facility expires? Well, the first reason is because there's still massive losses sitting on bank's balance sheets. Right now, unrealized losses make up almost one third of bank equity capital. Still, this is not a situation that is getting better. It's a situation that is staying bad. The second reason is that this facility expires in March. Now you may think, well, that 
Why would anybody be using it right now if it's gonna be expiring in March? It's because it's not gonna be ending the way you think it's gonna be ending. According to this fact sheet from federalreserve.gov, the program being open until March of 2024 means that advances can be requested until at least March of 2024. And those advances, those loans, those agreements, I'm gonna sell you the treasury to get the cash and I'll buy it from you a year later, can begin up until it expires in March of 2024. So so as we've seen usage of this facility skyrocket, all of these new loans that are being created still have one year of time left on them from the date that they were created. So starting in March of 2024, no new advances can be made, but the existing ones stay in place until they mature. So from the bank's perspective, this is literally like the last chance to unload those unrealized losses on the Fed and get that full price cash from them until it's no longer available. So if we're not gonna see all these banks have to buy buy back all of these underwater bonds starting in March of 2024, then what exactly does happen when this facility expires in just a couple of months? Well, coincidentally, another facility at the Fed that I talk about a lot is also probably going to be stopping its usage right around March of 2024. And this facility is the reverse repurchase facility at the Federal Reserve, which peaked in about April of 2023 and over the course of the rest of that year declined in its usage. And as of the day of this recording, there there's only $679 billion left in this facility. Considering the rate at which funds are leaving this facility, about $1.6 trillion has left this facility in the last nine months. This facility will probably be completely empty by the time the bank term funding program expires. So. Why is that a big deal? What do those two things have in common with each other? Well, one of the reasons why banks were seeing issues with deposit flight is because interest rates were going up. Money market funds, new banks offering high yield savings accounts, and treasury bills were all paying way higher interest rates than what you could get in a bank because the bank was locked into assets paying almost nothing. So they had almost nothing left over to pass on to depositors. So depositors said, hey, look, you're not going to be able to pay me what I want, but they are, so I'm gonna take my money out and put it over there. One of the biggest recipients of this deposit flight from banks went into money market funds. So what does the reverse repo facility have to do with this? Well, money market funds put most of the cash that they got into the reverse repo facility. And this is because the reverse repo facility was paying a risk-free rate directly from the Fed, the money printer, that was equal to the Fed funds rate. So for a while, if you were able to get your cash into the reverse repo, repo facility at the Fed, the Fed would pay you a better interest rate than you could get anywhere. And so over the course of 2021 and 2022, this facility attracted trillions of dollars in cash, peaking at about $2.3 trillion in March of 2023. Most of this from money market funds, people taking money out of the bank, putting it in money market funds, and the money market fund taking that, putting it in the reverse repo facility, passing most of those earnings back through to the investors. And any dollar held in the reverse repo facility is not held inside the banking system. You see, when you go to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk and you swipe your debit card, a dollar or five dollars leaves your bank account and gets transferred over to the bank account of the grocery store. Now, this might be at the same bank if you and the grocery store both have your bank accounts at the same bank, in which case, the only thing that happens is that bank goes into their Excel spreadsheet and says, five dollars moved from this account to this account. Nothing changed, it was just on paper. But it also might be true that they bank at a different bank than you. So all day long, you have a bunch of people and a bunch of businesses making transactions with each other, and you've got trillions of dollars going through the system, and you've got money being sent from this account over this account, from this bank to this bank. But the reality is those dollars never actually move because they're batch settled at the end of the day. At the end of the day, Chase will look to Bank of America and Chase will say, hey, we've got $10 billion that need to be sent over to you, but you've got $9 billion that needs to be sent over to us because of all of our customers who have transacted with each other. So instead, I'm just gonna send you $1 billion and we'll call it even. No reason for me to send you 10 and then you to send me back nine. I'll just send you the one and it's the same. As a result of this, most transactions that happen in the banking system net out. At the end of the day, some banks have a little bit extra cash, some banks have a little bit less cash, but all of the money stays inside the banking system. But when you have the reverse repo facility sucking cash out of the banking system, you wind up with banks on net not having enough cash. You end up with bank runs. 
you end up with deposit flight. And then the Fed has to step in with their other facility to bail those same banks out. But that whole situation is unraveling now and it is undoing itself. Because if you look at the interest rate that the US government is paying on short-term debt T-bills, you can get over 5% by loaning your money to the government for even just a couple of months, which is better than what you can get by keeping your money in the reverse repo facility at the Fed. And so logically, that money is being pulled out of the reverse repo facility and being lent to the US government instead. But what happens when money gets lent to the US government? They spend it. And what happens when the government spends money? it goes into somebody's bank account. So over the last six to nine months, we've seen the reverse repo facility being drained, which is getting lent to the US government through T-bills instead, which the government is then spending going into people's bank accounts, which is reversing the deposit flights that caused some of the issues to begin with. Not the unrealized loss issues, but the deposit flight issues that would have caused them to have to sell those assets at the lower prices. And so when the Fed ends the bank term funding program in March, that will likely be around the same time when the reverse repo facility has been fully drained, which means that banks at that time won't necessarily have to worry about deposit flight on net because all that cash has been recycled and re-entered the banking system, which is why despite many people saying that the Federal Reserve is just going to extend the BTFP, I don't think that they will because they're going to realize they don't have to. The only thing that causes a problem when a bank has an asset with an unrealized loss is being forced to sell it. And the only way they're forced to sell it at that loss is through deposit withdrawals. And that is no longer happening. Instead, we are seeing the reversal happen. Now, unless you are a bank, you don't have a bailout. You don't have anybody coming to rescue you. Increasing your income and protecting your wealth has always been up to only you. So if you'd like to work with me and join hundreds of other members of Heresy Financial University who are learning how to grow their wealth, despite the crazy economic storms happening all around us pretty much on an ongoing basis now. I'm running a limited use sale right now. There's 10 slots available. You have to use code YouTube50. This is for the annual plan only. If you use code YouTube50, you'll get half off for life. This code can only be used 10 times. It is on a first come first serve basis. And so if you miss it, you'll just have to wait until I open up another 10 slots at some point in the future. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.